Hey, this is Warren Redlick, ready for part two of breaking down Q3, the Tesla Q3 investor call. Here we go. Wait, 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 sorry. Are you ready? Let's go. I mean, we have an incredible product portfolio. I think we've got the most exciting product portfolio of any company on earth. Um, some of which you've heard about, some of which you haven't. We're in the, the, the final uh, lap for Cybertruck. Um, we're building the Cybertruck line here at uh, Giga Texas, Austin, making a lot of progress in the RoboTaxi platform design. Uh, with respect to uh, batteries, we're moving as fast as possible to have to, to achieve a thousand gigawatt hours a year of production capacity in the United States. So a thousand a thousand gigawatt hours in the United States is a big deal. We've heard them talk before about they wanted to do three terawatt hours, a thousand gigawatt hours is a terawatt hour. They, we, at Battery Day, they talked about trying to achieve three terawatt hours. They talked more about the long-term goal of 300 terawatt hours of batteries total produced, not per year, but total produced. Maybe 400 terawatt hours total produced. So they're you know, big goals that they're setting. You also mentioned Cybertruck. We're going to hear more about Cybertruck shortly. You mentioned Robotax. We're going to hear more about Robotaxi shortly. Let's keep going. Vertically integrated. So anode cathode lithium refining, um, we're moving at a tough speed to, to do that. The cathode factory is being built at Giga Texas. They're also going to be building a lithium refining plant in Corpus Christi, Texas. They, that's going to come up later as well. This is all part of the plan to get to where they can make 1,000 gigawatt hours in the United States. They're building the supply chain so that they can achieve those goals. It's an incredibly exciting future um, and really an unprecedented future. But none of this would be possible without the incredible team that we have here at Tesla. Um, so I'd like to give a, a huge shout out to all of our factory employees, uh, engineers, executives, and the, the whole Tesla team. One quick thing I'll mention is during the call, I like investor calls when Elon's not there. Um, there's only been one so far. And I think you're going to hear in the course of this call that Zach or Drew or somebody else is speaking and Elon interrupts them. And I, I think... I want to hear what Zach and Drew and 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 Lars and whoever has to say, and then hear Elon. But I, I, he's interrupting now. I'll give Drew, Zach and Drew credit. They let Elon have his say, and then they go right back to what they were going to say. So you do get it. But I do think it's like, hey, Elon, let them go. Let them speak. Thank you very much. And Zach has some opening remarks as well. Next, we're going to hear from Zachary Kirkhorn. Zach is the CFO or a master of coin for Tesla. In theory, he's a bean counter. He's way more than a bean counter. Uh, if you if you follow Zach, I think Zach is fantastic. Love Zach. So let's hear what he has to say next. And I should say, personally, I find the the recitation of the financial stuff less important when you're thinking about the long term for the company. But I think Zach does as well as anybody at doing that. Just to continue on Elon's theme, I just want to thank and congratulate the Tesla team for achieving record vehicle deliveries, production, and storage deployments in the third quarter. On automotive profitability, our gap operating margin was 17.2%, with automotive gross margin at 27.9%. Operating margin is one of our best yet, with improvements in operating leverage. However, Austin and Berlin ramp costs weighed on our margins, particularly if you compare it to Q1. One of my biggest concerns about the numbers I see is that margins weren't better than Q1, they were actually significantly worse than Q1. And what's happened is Tesla is accounting for the costs of Giga Texas and Giga Berlin. And those costs weren't material as much in Q1 because they weren't really producing cars yet. Now that they're producing cars, those costs get spread over a small number of cars now, when ultimately those factories are producing a much larger number of cars, the costs of the factory are spread over a larger number of cars and you get better margins. And that's a failing on my part of not recognizing they haven't fully ramped yet. So those margins are going to be a big impact. I failed to listen carefully when Elon said these factories are burning billions of dollars until they ramp, until they're producing 10,000 vehicles a week, right? Right now they're producing 2,000 vehicles a week. The costs of the factory that you amortize annually or quarterly, whatever, those costs of the factory are spread over one fifth as many cars if you're producing 2,000 cars a week, as if you're producing 10,000 cars a week. So that hurts margins. It doesn't hurt real long-term value of the company, but it hurts those short-term numbers. Removing regulatory credits and Austin and Berlin, our operating margins would have been our strongest yet, and auto gross margin would have been nearly 30%. 
Note that while small and growing, each car we build in Austin and Berlin is contributing positively to profitability. We also continue to experience margin headwinds associated with macroeconomic conditions, as we've discussed at length on prior calls. In particular, raw materials, logistics, uh, and foreign exchange was a big part of this past quarter. Foreign exchange was a big part of the past quarter. The dollar got stronger versus other currencies, and that reduces the contribution from other places to Tesla's overall profit story. On energy profitability, we achieved our strongest gross profit yet for this business, driven primarily by record volumes of our Megapack and Firewall products. Our free cash flows were also a record, despite an increase in cars in transit at the end of the quarter, which has a negative impact on working capital. Specifically on cars in transit, as noted in our press release on October 2nd, we've started to experience limits on outbound logistics capacity, which we didn't anticipate. This issue is particularly present for ships from Shanghai to Europe and local trucking within certain parts of the U.S. and Europe. That's a key point that that there's this shift from jamming as many cars out to customers at the end of the quarter to let's spread it out. And what's happened is they just don't have the ability. In the past, it was like, okay, let's spend some more money to get these vehicles delivered so we can get them out by the end of the quarter. And now it's like the capacity just isn't there. It's not viable. You can't. It can't be done. So Tesla is coming to grips with the reality, hey, we have to end this end of quarter push. We're going to spread the deliveries out over the quarter. And that makes the logistics, the availability of trucks, the availability of shipping becomes a lot smoother if you take your if you take your chill pill on that and you do it normally. As Tesla grows, this becomes a bigger problem, right? Right now, Tesla's producing, say, 2 million cars a year. When Tesla's producing 5 million cars a year, that logistics problem is going to be even harder and hopefully they see that and they're planning ahead for, you know what, we're going to have even bigger logistics problems in the future when we're producing that many cars. So we got to figure out how to get that done. And knowing the Tesla team, they're on it. Our historical operating pattern of batch building by delivery region leads to extreme concentrations of outbound logistics needs in the final weeks of each quarter. Just to put this in perspective, roughly two thirds of our Q3 deliveries occurred in September and one third in the final two weeks. As a result, we've begun to smooth regional builds throughout the quarter to reduce our peak needs for outbound logistics. Just to be clear, there are the third quarter is July, August, and September. So September is where a lot of the deliveries have been occurring, and they're trying to smooth it out so they get an even flow of deliveries all three months of a quarter. Next quarter is October, November, December. We're in October now, so the next three months, they're going to try to smooth deliveries out. And I think they're going to mention at some point that they expect deliveries for Q4 to be below production because of this approach. Even though they have vehicles from Q3 that weren't delivered that will be delivered in Q4, because production is growing so fast, there's going to be vehicles produced at the end of the quarter that aren't delivered. And that volume is going to be more than vehicles produced at the end of the third quarter that weren't delivered. We expect this to simplify our operations, reduce costs, and improve the experience of our customers. Just the cost reduction point, if you're jamming as many vehicles as you can out and, and pushing the logistics, you're you end up paying more for shipping. You end up paying more for trucking because you're getting that last truck. Your 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 demand is high, so you're going to raise prices. So by smoothing it out, the hope is that the cost of delivering cars goes down. The cost on a per car basis, you spend less money getting the cars out to the customers. Makes sense. As we look ahead, our plans show that we're on track for the 50% annual growth in production this year, although we are tracking supply chain risks, which are beyond our control. Key point here, they're still tracking 50% growth in production. That by, by saying it that way, we know they're not tracking 50% growth in delivery, and he's still acknowledging there are threats to getting to that 50% growth, that there may be supply chain issues that will stop them from getting there. I, I think they've got that nailed down, but you never know when supply chain issue comes up that makes it a problem. On the delivery side, we do expect to be just under 50% growth due to an increase in the cars in transit at the end of the year, as noted just above. This means that, again, you should expect a gap between production and deliveries in Q4, and those cars in transit will be delivered shortly to their customers upon arrival to their destination in Q1. Austin and Berlin ramp costs will continue to weigh on margins, although we expect the impact to be less than what we saw in Q3. So that's telling you Q4 margins won't be as great as, say, Q1 we're still going to see a hangover on margins for a while. And I think we're going to see that in Q1 of 2023 as well, that the margins just aren't going to get there because they're still ramping the factories. 
where the cost of amortizing those factories and the other costs that go along with the factories are spread over a smaller volume of cars until they get to a certain point, which my guess is 10,000 vehicles a week, which might not be for several months, you're going to see an impact on margins from Giga Texas and Giga Berlin. And as Elon mentioned, we are continuing to build as many cars as possible while also maintaining strong operating margins. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let's go first through the shareholder questions. The first shareholder question is, given the stringent battery content and assembly requirements for consumer tax credit eligibility under the Inflation Reduction Act, can you speak to Tesla's ability to meet those thresholds in each of 2023, 2024, and 2025 with your existing and planned supply chain? The federal government passed the Congress and, and, the, and the president put together this Inflation Reduction Act, which I call the Inflation Acceleration Act. That's a whole political conversation we don't need to get into. I don't think this is reducing inflation at all. But the bill, the law, contains a lot of incentives for electric vehicles. And people who are watching this closely are saying, this is a huge windfall for Tesla. The, the potential for amount of money it saves Tesla, both in battery production, the cost of batteries that are going into Tesla cars if they're produced in Tesla factories is crazy. The tax credit that goes to vehicle sales, will Tesla capture some of that tax credit by adjusting its pricing? I think a lot of those, and, and, the, and the, the mix of what vehicles are sold at what price points, I think we're going to see that happen in January, if not Maybe it'll be a little later than January, but I think that's something that would, should probably take effect January 1st to maximize what Tesla can get out of the Inflation Reduction Act tax credits and also you know, benefit customers as much as possible while you're doing so. Since demand is greater than supply, you can't just say, okay, we're going to give the customers a windfall because you're going to increase demand and you're going to increase wait time. So Tesla has to manage on the one hand, getting customers the benefit they should get from the tax credit, but also getting some value from shareholders from that tax credit and not making wait times too long on the cars. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think just at a high level, I'll say uh, we do expect to fully meet the um, IRA's requirements. So the first point there is there's a lot of requirements in the IRA in order to qualify for certain tax credits. As far as the tax credits for the cars themselves, so the customer getting a $7,500 tax credit, I think that one's pretty straightforward. The battery manufacturing credits, there are some quirks in there about where you're getting your supplies for your battery materials. But, you know, Tesla's building its own cathode factory on Giga, Texas. They're building their own lithium refining factory on the coast of Texas uh, near Corpus Christi. They're working on steps to secure their supply chain and make sure their supply chain for batteries in the United States, that that supply chain fits what's required by the statute. I think that those requirements become more stringent later in time. So 2023 is not as hard when you get to 24 and 25, that's going to be a bigger challenge. But Tesla's already building the, the infrastructure to take advantage of that. And Elon seems confident of it. We view the passing of the Inflation Reduction Act as a significant boost towards accelerating our mission, while also scaling the battery supply chain at large in the United States. We expect Treasury to publish detailed guidance by the end of the year. Until such time, it's difficult to fully determine the eligibility criteria. But we believe Tesla is very well positioned to capture a significant share of that for solar storage and also electric vehicles. So what's happened is the law was passed, but it's not 100% clear what you have to do to qualify for credits, what you have to qualify for the benefits of this, this law. So they're waiting for Treasury, which is the U.S. Department of the Treasury, to, which is, runs the IRS, basically, to clarify what they mean how they're going to interpret the statute so that the companies that are producing batteries and producing electric vehicles know in advance, what do we have to do to qualify for these credits? And that's, that's a, a relatively normal function that the, the agency that's administering these taxes is asked, hey, can you clarify for us, how are you gonna interpret this? And then we know how to play the game to fit into your interpretation. I said earlier, we're, we're gonna go basically pedal to the metal. Uh, as fast as humanly possible to get to a thousand gigawatt, gigawatt hours a year of production in the U.S. Uh, vertically integrated. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, the next question is: What updates can you offer on the backlog and recent order intake trends, especially outside of the U.S. and especially in China? So there's this perception of backlog issues that Tesla, you know, is all of a sudden not. It, this is really a demand-related question. We'll see, uh, listen to what Elon has to say about that. There's, there's definitely, you know, China is uh, experiencing um, a bit of a, res of a recession of sorts, uh, which is property market, seems to be driven by property market mostly. Um, and Europe has a re recession of sorts uh, driven by energy 
the U.S. actually is in pretty good. North, North, North America is in pretty good health. Um, although the Fed is raising interest rates more than they should, but I think they'll eventually realize that and bring it back down again. The demand is a little harder than it would otherwise be. But as I said earlier, um, we um, are extremely confident of the great Q4, um, and we uh, anticipate continuing to grow uh, our, our vehicle production sales deliveries by, uh, on average, 50% a year as far into the future as we can see. So Elon is reiterating here the demand is there. We're going to be able to make many more cars, and we're going to be able to sell them. Uh, he doesn't seem concerned about demand at all. I think Zach, similarly, I forget, I think it was Zach at some point indicates, you know, they're not seeing demand pressures. People are imagining demand pressures, demand problems. There is overall in the economies, in the Chinese economy, in the European economy, there may be some reduction in demand overall in the world, but the demand for Tesla cars is off the charts. It has been off the charts. This is not, this is an imagined problem. It's not a real problem. One caveat, I should say, uh, growing production by 50%. Every year, because deliveries, we're trying to smooth out the deliveries and, and not um, have this crazy delivery wave at the end of every quarter. So, um, in fact, we were just fundamentally running out of, uh, there weren't enough boats, there weren't enough trains, there weren't enough car carriers to actually support the wave. Tesla got too big. So, whether we, whether we like it or not, we actually have to smooth out the delivery of cars into a quarter because there just aren't enough uh, transportation uh, the objects to move them around. Yeah, this is one of those moments where I wish an analyst would have asked, well, okay, looking down the road, do you have enough logistics capacity to handle your volume when you double production or you triple production? Is there going to be enough trains, enough trucks, enough boats to be able to get your products out to the customers then? That's actually a reasonable question. I think you're looking, you know, two, three years from now, that delivery wave is going to be like, you're going to have logistics problems year round, unless some increase happens with logistics for delivering vehicles. Maybe I'll ask Elon that on Twitter. The next question is, do you still expect 50% annualized growth uh, for the foreseeable future? Is this also true specifically for the Chinese domestic market? Do you expect uh, <laughs> to need to cut vehicle prices or offer incentives in any market to sustain the demand? <clears throat> or has demand remained stable? Or is it even rising? <laughs> Quite a few questions there. <laughs> well, like I said, we, we want to sort of focus on, at a high level on what do we think is possible here? We, to the best of our knowledge, we believe that Tesla will continue to grow for, uh, deliveries and revenue production at a 50% or greater compound annual growth rate. It might occasionally be a year that is a little less, and then some years will be maybe a little more or a lot more. Um, in, in some of our out year planning, we see potential annual growth rates that are in excess of 50%. That's a nice positive thing for Elon to say that when we're looking further down the road, we're actually seeing more than 50% growth at a certain point in the future. And I think when we hear about this robo-taxi vehicle, that's going to make more sense. The next question is, can you tell us more about the product feature roadmap beyond new models and FSP, and especially for interior and powertrain of existing vehicle models? Yeah. <laughs> We, we could, but who won't? <laughs> Sorry, guys, we, we can't. We, we can't like jump the gun on future product announcements. Committed to continuous improvement. Yeah, we obviously are continuing. Yes, first, obviously, Tesla's not yet. But we'll also be committed to continuous improvement. <laughs> yeah, um, at Tesla, we've always been committed to continuous improvement. So, um, as friends of mine ask me, like, when should I buy a car? I'm like. And now, because we just keep improving the cars. Uh, it's always the, the latest Tesla. Yeah, the best of the latest Tesla. And I'm really, yeah, the, the, the new, and, you know, every, time, every, every now and again, we do have some, you know, big technology upgrade like Plaid. Um, and by the way, I think the Plaid model S and X are just the, the best cars on earth. Best, there's, there's nothing even close, in my opinion. Uh, just try one. Yeah. Epic. They avoided answering that question. I think they actually give a little bit more later in this call when they start talking about the robo taxi platform, but this time they didn't talk about it. And then later they do kind of get into it. Uh, and the point about the Plaid S and the Plaid X being the best cars in the world, I drive a Plaid X, it's pretty spectacular. I, I'm 
quite happy with my Plaid Model X. Uh, it's stunning in terms of performance. It's stunning in terms of comfort. Uh, I've had as many as five people in the car, uh, you know, with third row, uh, an adult sitting in the third row, very comfortable, you know, great in so many different ways. So I, I and my, I have a friend who has a Plaid S, Eva McMillan, and she loves her Plaid S. They're spectacular cars. Uh, the next question is, uh, we keep hearing of dire energy crisis in Germany this winter. What are Tesla's plans to com combat power cuts? And will there be any delays in ramp up in production from Giga Berlin because of this? Yeah, I can take it. <laughs> um, I think two points on this question. Uh, the, the first is that, uh, you know, based upon everything that we know, we don't see this as a large risk to the company. Um, you know, even if production down, did go down for a period of time, this is all near term. It doesn't have any impact on the long term of the company. But we don't. We're not. We, we have no indication whatsoever None. that we will have to cut our production in Germany. No. See, that, that's that moment where Elon is interrupting. Uh, you know, Zach was doing fine, and Elon's in, like, Elon just let Zach talk. You can let Zach finish and then say what you want to say. But he didn't let Zach talk. He cut him off. Now Zach is not a uh, shrinking flower. Zach is going to, you know, go ahead and say what he wanted to say. But Elon had to jump that in there. But, you know, there's no, basically, they're not concerned about power cuts in Germany. The short story. And we put in place backup plans and we're working through the supply chain as well. Um, nearly all of our suppliers are prepared as well. That's an important point. It's not just that Tesla's factory has the power to go through and, and be able to build vehicles, but that the supply chain that supplies things to Tesla, supplies materials, supplies equipment to Tesla, that their supply chain, also they've made sure that their supply chain has plans to deal with any potential power cuts. And basically, it seems like they're not worried about it, but I think it's more that they've anticipated potential problems and they've gotten ahead of the game, which is something that the Tesla team tends to do. We'll see how this plays out, but it's not something that we're terribly worried about. I think that's the, that's the key language. I love that way Zach hit that. That's not something we're terribly worried about. I feel good about that. And, and I love when it comes, this is the thing I think Elon doesn't get. As, as an investor myself, I love Elon, but I love hearing it from the team. I love hearing it from Zach. I love hearing it from Drew. I love hearing it from Martin. I love hearing it from Lars. Um, I, I love hearing from people beyond Elon, deeper in the team, hey, we got this. That, that gives a lot more confidence, because Elon's always confident, but it's really good to get more confidence from other people on the team. That's just my take. I think other people see that as well. And Elon, I wish you'd see that. Let Zach talk. Let Drew talk. Give those guys a chance. They nail it. Believe in them. You know, believe in their ability to speak and at least hold what you got to say until they're done. And I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of guy who interrupts people too. So it's, you know, kind of funny for me criticizing Elon for that. I'm just saying as somebody listening, let Zach go. Thank you. And the next question is, how is production planning going for the Cybertruck? What is the initial phase one production target? When can we expect an update on pricing and final design? As, as Elon said earlier, we'd be on product, uh, facilities preparations here in Giga, Texas for Cybertruck. Um, we're still on track to enter uh, early production in the middle of next year. We've started our um, beta builds uh, of all of the battery, battery, and existing. Lars, when can I drop my beta? <laughs> <laughs> that was the question. In, in, in a few weeks. Lars, <laughs> okay, great. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you. And <laughs> that's, that's going well. Um, and, uh, you know, we continue ramping up through the end of next year and in, into 2023. Good. Cybertruck is on course. Uh, they're going to enter early production middle of next year. Beta builds about to be ready. If I understood that correctly, I'm not sure I did. Elon wants to know when he gets his beta build. Like Elon wants his beta version of Cybertruck so he can start driving that around. If, if I heard him correctly, maybe I heard him wrong. Yeah, the car's going to be sick. And it's sick. That's going to be a Hall of Famer next level. Sorry, for, sorry it took it longer than expected. But, you know, there were a few things that got in the way, like insane global supply chain shortages and pandemics. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Force majeures if there ever was one. It tells a semi, of course. You know, so, so we'll be handing over our first production test of semis. Um, to Pepsi on December first, um, I'll be there in person, and um, we'll be begin ramping up uh, production of the Tesla Semi, which is a um, max load heavy, a heavy, a heavy truck. Yeah, that's the class A truck. Class A truck. No sacrifice to cargo capacity. Yeah, no sacrifice. Exactly. No sac Very important. No sacrifice to cargo capacity. Five hundred mile range. My, I'm, 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 just be clear, right? Five hundred miles with the cargo. Yeah, fire miles with the cargo yeah. on, on level ground. Yeah, fair. 
you know, <laughs> so not, not, not up, you know, that close. Um, but the point is, it's a, a long range truck, and, and even with heavy cargo. Um, and the number of times people told me, oh, you, you can't, it's impossible to make a long range, uh, heavy duty class A truck. Um, and then I asked, well, well, what are your assumptions about what out kilogram and what hours per mile? And they would look at me with a blank stare and then say hydrogen. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's that's not the answer. But I was looking for numbers. Um, <laughs> <and> literally, <laughs> that's that's not a number. That's an element on the periodic table. Um, anyway, you obviously don't need hydrogen for heavy trucking. That's what we're trying to make here. Um, and we'll be ramping up uh, semi-production through next year. Uh, as as you know, like everyone knows at this point, uh, it, it takes you know, about a year to ramp up production. So we expect to see significant, um, uh, we're, we're tentatively aiming for 50,000 units in 2024 for um, Tesla Semi in, in North America. And, and uh, obviously we'll expand beyond North America. Okay, so that was pretty big. First of all, that there's no compromise on cargo capacity. There was a perception before that the weight of the semi itself was going to be so high that the carrying capacity of the, the of the trailer would have to be reduced. And Drew is insistent, no, it's going to be the same carrying capacity as a diesel truck and a very impressive target of 50,000 semis a year, which it sounds like they're saying in 2024, they're going to deliver or produce 50,000 semis in the United States, North America, and they're going to expand and produce in other countries. Elon, you know, not, dropping not only our target of 50,000 semis a year, but also we're planning to produce more of them in other countries. So that's probably going to be a European semi factory. There's probably going to be a Chinese semi factory. And we're going to look to semi growing really dramatically and becoming a really big contributor. Now, you know, that's fairly low volume though. You know, 50,000 vehicles versus a million model Ys or more than one and a half million model Ys. And then the robo taxi vehicle is going to be even higher volume. Um, and, you know, even though the semi is going to be more expensive, you know, let's say it's 300, I think they said it's $180,000, but let's say it's $300,000, 300,000 times 50,000. It's just not that big compared to 1.5 million model Ys at $60,000. It's just, you know, the, the 1.5 million is so much more than the 50,000 that it offsets the increase in price of the semi. So semi still important, still important for accelerating the transition to sustainable energy adds a lot of value in a lot of ways. Um, really exciting to see that they're making progress on that and that target. And that, by the way, they're planning to produce it in Nevada. That's the, the document. I think it's page seven of the slide deck says that semi is being produced or in production in Nevada. That's exciting. I think there's going to be an interesting question about what will the semi price be really? Because I don't think they can really sell that vehicle for $180,000. And then somewhere else in the call, it sounds like they're making the early semis with 2170 cells at a 4680 cells. I got that wrong. I'm surprised by that. One of the many things I've gotten wrong so far. Um, I think they, I don't know if they said 2170s, but they're not 4680s. Let's, let's keep going and see if we hear that. And, and these would sell, I don't want to say what sacrifice is, but they're much more than a passenger vehicle. So <laughs> the 50,000 uh, heavy trucks of this nature would be worth several um, model lines. Okay, so several model wise, we can assume is more than maybe five model wise or more. If a Model Y is, say, $70,000, then that's $350,000. If a Model Y is $60,000, it's at least $300,000. So it sounds like the price point for semi is going to be $300,000 or higher. It might be $400,000. Now, my impression is the value delivered by semi is so high in fuel savings, the cost of diesel fuel versus the cost of electricity, um, the cost, the reliability that it's going to deliver. I've, I've got a friend who tests who's a test driver for tesla semi and he he is like convinced because he and he's a, a guy with a history of driving trucks he's blown away by how amazing tesla semi is you know still they're still getting the finer details worked out it's not like as last time i talked to him they weren't ready but they were really close to production now they're in production and my my sense is this vehicle is going to be worth a, a crazy high valuation it's going to generate a lot of revenue for tesla for the volume that they deliver. But in the end, like I said, it's not going to be nearly as much of an impact as the Model Y and then this robo taxi vehicle that's coming is going to be even bigger. So it's it's good to see. It's helpful. It's a, it's an important part of the business, but don't get carried away. 
The next question is, what is the progress of the 4680 cell ramp and what factors determine whether vehicles get 2170s versus 4680 cells? And how will that change in the next year? Yeah, ramp is going well, as Elon said. Uh, cell output is up 3x quarter over quarter. Cell output is up 3x quarter over quarter. So Tesla has increased production of 4680 cells, tripled production of 4680 cells from Q2 to Q3. That is really, really fast growth. Hopefully that will be sustained. And production is tracking to exceed 1,000 car sets per week this quarter, as we said. Just to be clear, production is tracking to exceed 1,000 car sets. The ramp is going well, as Elon said. Uh, total output is up 3x quarter over quarter. Um, and production is tracking to exceed 1,000 car sets per week this quarter, as we said. So 1,000 car sets per week would be 50,000 cars a year. And presumably that's growing fast. A thousand car sets a week. So that if Giga Texas is producing 2000 model Ys a week, then this is going to be half of those vehicles. Now, probably by the end of the quarter, Giga Texas will be up to 4,000 vehicles a week or maybe 5,000 vehicles a week. And then 1,000 vehicles a week would be a, a relatively small share of that, but still, you know, a quarter, a fifth, that's not bad. Um, it's, I'm puzzled by what's holding. It seems like there should be more cells. It seems like they should be able to do more. I don't know what's going on there. You figure each vehicle has 828 cells. So a thousand vehicles has 828,000 cells. So yeah, I mean, you know, if, if you did a one, one million vehicles back in, Jan if you did 1 million cells back in January, it's going to take a while. You're basically looking at a million cells a week at a thousand sets a week. So you, that would mean you need 13 million cells a quarter. So they're, you know, the, compared to January where they had 1 million, I can see where 13 million a quarter would be, you know, that's a challenge to get to, but it looks like they're making it. Our focus is now shifting from 100% ramp to cost and further expanding production capacity in North America, uh, as Elon also mentioned. On the 2170 versus 4680 um, in our factories, we, we really attempt to minimize factory complexity and product changeover while still making sure we get enough new product into the field to learn how it is performing. Um, and that 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 sort of mix is going to shift as uh, four six eighty scales here and the overall factory ramp. I, I need to hear that again. One thousand car sets per week this quarter, as we said uh, last quarter. Um, our focus is now shifting from one hundred percent ramp to cost and further expanding production capacity in North America. Our focus is shifting from one hundred percent ramp to. Things like cost, they want to get their cost of manufacturing down so the cost of the cells goes down because that will help margins down the road as well. Up, up, and they're still working on you know increasing production capacity, but it's interesting that they're less focused, it sounds like, on ramping, increasing production, and more focused on producing in a cost-effective manner. Okay. Like, you know, you kind of want to go through these waves of like we're focusing on efficiency first, now we're focusing on volume, and then we're focusing on efficiency again, and then we're focusing on energy density. There's a lot of different uh, levers they need to focus on, a lot of different angles of 4680 they need to get down. So that's good progress. But basically, in a nutshell, 4680 ramp is growing exponentially, uh, and um, it's going well. We're just looking good. This, this, this yeah. is going to be a very major factor in the future. Sure. Like, it packs up sick. Yes. Um, like you said, we're... Our, our goal is to strive towards 1,000 gigawatt hours a year of annualized production in the United States alone. By Tesla. Starting big suppliers. So it's 1,000 gigawatt hours a year in the United States, he said this time, not North America. In the United States alone, not including suppliers. That sounds like they're not going to be producing batteries in Canada if they're going for 1,000 gigawatt hours a year in North America. And now he says 1,000 gigawatt hours in the United States. Now, maybe that's a slip of the tongue. Maybe they're still planning to produce batteries in Canada, if that's the plan. Sounds to me like maybe they're not producing batteries. In, that's one possible interpretation is that they're not going to produce batteries in Canada. They have no plans to do so. They plan on producing batteries in the United States. And that would make sense given the massive tax credits that the United States government passed in the Inflation Acceleration Act or Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, it would make sense to, hey, let's focus battery production in a place where we're getting these massive credits. It's something like $40 a kilowatt hour credit, which when you do a thousand gigawatt hours, you know, $40 a kilowatt hour, $40,000 a megawatt hour, $40, $40 million a kilo, a gigawatt, $40 million a gigawatt hour, $40 billion for a thousand gigawatt hours. It's a big deal.
Plans would be on top of that. We need to get 300 to 400 terawatt hours built to accomplish our goal. Yeah, this is roughly <laughs> to transition Earth to sustainable energy. Our rough calculation um, to, for both uh, stationary and vehicles um, is 300 to 400,000 gigawatt hours or three to 400 terawatt hours. If you think about it, if Tesla is making 1,000 gigawatt hours a year in the United States and the goal is 300,000 or 400,000 gigawatt hours, that 1,000 gigawatt hours is just a start. And if Tesla's doing 1,000 gigawatt hours in Europe and 1,000 gigawatt hours in China, that's 3,000 gigawatt hours. You're still well short of how long is it going to take you to get to 300,000 gigawatt hours if you're only producing 3,000 gigawatt hours. So obviously the hope is that suppliers are going to produce a lot of battery cells. The ATL certainly seems on the path to that. LG Chem certainly seems to be on the path to that. But Tesla's trying to drive the industry, drag the industry kicking and screaming towards producing a much higher volume of battery cells. So when you're like, one terawatt sounds like a lot. Well, it's a lot of terawatt hours to go. Yeah, and I should say, <laughs> like, on, the, on the cathode side, the, the main cathode we think would probably be uh, iron. Um, and um, uh, like most of the ions, because iron, iron can scale to very, very high tonnage. And, um, and then so, some nickel, the exact percentages are hard to figure out, but it's, it's probably, probably at least twice as much uh, iron cathode as, as nickel. Um, maybe more, and uh, and then this the manganese wild card as well. Is that sound right, Peter? Yep. Okay. And on that note, we're pursuing aggressively North American iron cathode supplies. Yeah. Okay, so that was a big detail from Drew. They're pursuing pursuing aggressively iron cathode supplies in North America. So. That sounds like Tesla is planning to make iron cathode cells in the United States, lithium iron phosphate cells. That's the first time I think we've heard that, that Tesla, if I've heard that correctly, and I think I heard that correctly, Tesla is going to make lithium iron phosphate battery cells in the United States. They've been relying on CATL for lithium iron phosphate. They may have started relying on BYD for lithium iron phosphate coming from China. It sounds like there's a very clear plan now from Tesla we're going to start building lithium iron phosphate cells in the United States. I think CATL is planning on building lithium iron phosphate cells in the United States as well, but it's great to see that. And, and, you know, Elon is saying, and he said this before that they expect a large share of the battery cells to be lithium iron phosphate because nickel is so expensive because lithium iron phosphate, because iron is so common. Um, I, it's so much easier to get the materials for an iron phosphate cell than it is to get materials for a nickel based cell. So, and the, the cost ends up being lower as well. That's part two. Part three is coming. All of these videos are available to my Patreon, locals, and YouTube channel exclusive content community members in advance. So please consider supporting me on the Locals platform, The Daily Live, warrenredlick.locals.com, on Patreon, patreon.com slash warrenredlick, or on this YouTube channel, just uh, join the channel. And if you join at the exclusive content level, you get all early access videos at the basic level. Sometimes I share early access videos. Please support me on those platforms. Please check out the t-shirts at elonbits.com. Cybertruck is coming. One of the most popular shirts on elonbits.com. Please check out my other videos. Get ready for video part three. Please like this video, share it and subscribe. And thank you so much for watching.